Hi, I'm Joseph Feraldi. I want to thank you for joining us here at Bayside Chapel online. Our prayer is that today's service will be a blessing to you, that it will encourage you in your journey with Jesus Christ, and it will help you to see all that God has in store for you. We would love to hear from you on how God is using this ministry to bless you, and we'd love the opportunity to pray for you. Just send us an email at amen at baysidechapel.org. Remember that you can stay in touch with us at any time. Just visit the App Store and search for our app at Bayside Chapel of NJ. Also, if God is using this ministry to bless you, we'd like to give you the opportunity to partner with us financially. Simply go online to BaysideChapel.org or use the Bayside Chapel app and choose whatever option works best for you. Enjoy today's message. So as a 24-year-old assistant pastor, and the pastor under whom I worked had assigned me to preach on a particular Sunday. It was to be September 20th, 1981. And the text that he assigned me to preach that day is the text that I'm bringing to you this morning. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. The most uh, familiar and perhaps most important of all texts in Scripture regarding the relationship between parents and children. Now the poignancy of the occasion was that at the beginning of the service that day, it had been announced that our first child had been born. Emily was born on the 17th, so that made me a dad of all of three days' experience. Now, the irony of the situation was that he assigned me to preach about parents and children to people who were generally much older than I was and who were much more experienced in parenting. And so uh, it was given to me on the day that as soon as I was done preaching, I was to go to the hospital and pick up Diane and Emily and bring them home for my own adventure in parenting to begin. And so I'm, I'm charged with preaching to much more experienced people about parents ought to do this and children ought to do that. And I'll have to say that I stand here today all these years later, 37 years later, with uh, Emily now having four children of her own and my next oldest daughter having two children, and my son just had his second son on Friday of this week. Yeah. Making us uh, grandparents for the eighth time, little Leo Allen Ritter, carrying on the Ritter name, um, was born. And, uh, and all these years later, I look back at that sermon I preached all those years ago, nearly 37 years ago, and I have to say, I wouldn't change too much of it. It held up pretty well. You know why? Because it came from God's word. And God doesn't steer us wrong, does he? And I think that it's true that all five of us, my wife, myself, our three kids, can all say that, no, we, we weren't perfect parents, and our kids weren't perfect p kids, but to the extent that we paid attention to and followed the instructions in God's word for parents and children, we have had a wonderful life together as a family. Now, I know that not everybody can say that. Uh, for a lot of people, family life is the source of tremendous heartache. Uh, you might be a a kid here today and you're saying, you know what, I'd like to have a great family life, I'd like to obey my parents and honor my father and mother, but you know, mom or dad or both are a mess and, and my life stinks because of it. Uh, someone else might be here and you're thinking, you know, I did my best to raise my kids right, but one or more of them rebelled and, and it's been a source of tremendous heartache for me. It's often the case that through no fault of your own, mainly due to the choices that other members of the family make that are out of your control, that it, it can really make family life difficult. And I'm certainly sympathetic to those for whom family life isn't, hasn't measured up to what you'd hoped it would be. I spent a lot of time as a pastor over the years uh, working with families, helping them through those difficult family situations. But I have to say that I have never countered a single family dysfunction that has disproved what I'm going to share with you today. I think it's still true that, that though you can't control what other members of the family might do, to the extent that you follow God's word, it is your absolute best hope for the kind of family we all would like to have. Now, we have to understand these instructions for parents and children in their larger context 
As we've been saying all the way through this series, you know, in the first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul is all about showing us who we are in Christ, all the amazing things that God has done in, in our lives to transform us, to adopt us into his own family, to help us walk in newness of life. And then in chapter four, all the way to the end of the book, chapters four, five, and six, it, it turns to uh, the subject of, okay, this is who you are in Christ, now how should you live in light of who you are in Christ? And we've been seeing how being in Christ transforms all of our most important relationships. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at that text that talks about don't be drunk with wine, but go on being filled with the Spirit. Uh, speaking to one another with songs and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always to God the Father for everything through the Lord Jesus Christ, and submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. He's showing us that part of being in Christ and part of being led by the Spirit of God, being empowered by the Spirit, is that we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, just as Jesus didn't put himself first, but put us first when he gave his life on the cross in payment for our sins, so we are to put the needs of others ahead of ourselves. And this idea of spirit-empowered believers submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ transforms all of our most important relationships. Last week, Pastor Ken talked about how it transforms relationships between, parent, uh, between uh, husbands and wives. And today we're going to look at how it transforms relationships between parents and children. We're going to look at ultimate family life, the kind of family life that is only possible when family members are walking in a manner worthy of their identity in Christ, living spirit-filled lives, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And I'm convinced that what God's word is showing us today is that those who are in Christ do family life best. Now, that may seem like a pretty brash claim. It may sound like one of those things that you know, Christians say that make it sound like they, they're better than everybody else, but that's not my intention here. My intention is not to say, wow, look at us, aren't we so great at doing family life? Uh, rather, the point is that God has done such amazing things for us and he has transformed us by his grace and, and in his spirit he makes us capable of living a whole different way from, from the way we used to live and the way from the, that other people live. And so it's a picture here of what can happen when parents are empowered by God's spirit and live the new life in Christ and when children in the family too are walking with Jesus. I'm convinced that family life doesn't get any better than that. And I think what, it's what Paul is getting at here when he shows us two reasons those who are in Christ do family life best. And, and here's the first. Children who are in Christ are more highly motivated to obey their parents. Children who are in Christ are more highly motivated to obey their parents than other kids might be. You know this familiar text. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Children, obey your parents. Honor your father and mother. These are two sides of the same coin. To obey means to listen to them, to follow them, to carry out the orders of, to be guided by them when they say you need to be home at a certain time or when they want to know your whereabouts or they want to know with whom you're going when they set limits on your screen time and say you, you can't have screen time till you finish your homework, or when they give you chores on Saturday morning. Children, obey your parents. Honor your father and mother. Honor is respect. It's showing your parents you value them. Honor is the form that love takes directed toward those whom God has placed in authority over us. And somebody says, yeah, but you don't know my parents. I mean, you know, they, they look all great and holy when they come to church, but I'm telling you, they're hypocrites. Uh, they're, they're not worthy of my respect. I don't like having to obey them. Why should I honor and obey those people? Well, Paul gives us, right tucked within this text, four powerful motivations for kids who know Jesus to, to obey their parents. And the first is this, it's the lordship of Christ himself. Notice in verse one it says, children obey your parents in the Lord. That's to say, you're in the Lord, you, you know Jesus as your savior, he's the Lord of your life. If, if you have trusted him to be your uh, rescuer from sin and your leader for life, then he has a claim on your life. He's your leader, 
You've got to follow what he says. And what he says is, obey your parents. In in fact, Paul says much the same thing in chapter 3 of the book of Colossians. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. So if you want to please the Lord, obey your parents. There's one motivation for kids who know Jesus to obey their parents. Here's a second. The very nature of things demands it. The very nature of things demands your obedience and your, and your respect and honor of your parents. It says there in the rest of verse one, children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. It's just plain right. It's, it's the very nature of things that you should do this. Some of you are old enough to remember this dude, Wilford Brimley, remember him? That gruff old guy who sold Quaker Oats cereal and he would... Uh, you know, be eating this bowl of Quaker oats and talking about why they're so good for you and your digestion and everything else. And and then he'd look straight into the camera, put his hand on the the cereal carton and say, Quaker oats, it's the right thing to do. You know, (laughs) that's kind of what Paul is saying here. Obey your parents. It's just plain right. It's the right thing to do. It's the, the fundamental nature of things demands it. If the young wander away from their parents, they'll get hurt. It's the practice of virtually every culture. Children are expected to pay attention to, to obey their parents. When our kids were younger and Diane would tell them to do something and they started to complain and say, but why do I have to? She would say, because it's the mother law. You didn't want to violate the mother law, I'll tell you that. Cooperate or you bear the consequences of defying a law of nature. As foolish as, it's as foolish to defy your mother or your father as it is to try and defy the law of gravity by climbing up on the roof of your house and jumping off. You're, you're sure to get hurt. And, and so Paul is giving motivation to kids to obey their parents. The lordship of Jesus, the very nature of things demands it. Uh, third, it's a command of primary importance for your life. Notice it goes on to say, Oh, got to go back one. There it is. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, for this is the first commandment with a promise. Now, scholars get kind of all twisted around about this first commandment with a promise thing because a lot of them will point out, well, it's not the first commandment, right? Children, obey your parents is the fourth commandment. Uh, the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. Well, then they say, well, it's the first commandment with a promise, But it's not the first commandment with a promise because the first commandment with a promise is the second commandment. The second commandment says, if you don't bow down to idols, then I will love you and care for you for generations to come. So the way that I think we need to understand this is to understand that he's really saying two things here. It's the first commandment and there's a promise. First commandment in the sense that it is the primary commandment for a child's moral development. It is the the first commandment in the sense that it is the first and most fundamental commandment a child will ever learn. Almost all of a child's moral understanding of right and wrong begins with being made aware of the moral authority of mom and dad. A a little kid's got to come to learn that these people are not to be messed with. They're boss, right? And and so the first lesson and all other lessons in a a child's moral development flow out of this one. Children, obey your parents. I remember when our daughter Emily was uh, just three or four years old and I asked her, Emily, do you know what sin is? And she immediately answered, it's when I disobey mom and dad. That, that's, kids learn that first. And if they don't, uh, things aren't gonna go very well for them in life. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Uh, the, the Lordship of Christ, the nature of things demands it. It's a command of primary importance for your life and there is a promise attached. It's the first commandment And it comes with a promise. The promise is right there in the fourth commandment that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. The person who obeys his parents is more likely to enjoy a less troublesome life and a longer one at that. So Dave Stone is a pastor who tells a story about when his family took a missions trip to the Dominican Republic. And if you've ever been in one of these developing countries, you know that the traffic can be crazy. And uh, they were in a little village. It was nighttime. It was dark. There was music blaring on the street where they were. Their son, uh, Samuel, six years old, was playing uh, on a curb. And there was a little curb and then the street. And he was uh, kind of walking along, one foot on 
the curb and then the next foot would be on the street and then back on the curb and back on the street and he was kind of zigzagging back and forth playing this little game. And Stone said, I was about 10 feet away from him and I said, Samuel, freeze. And he froze and at that moment, right where he would have stepped in the next second, a moped came firing by about 30 miles an hour. He said, if he had, if he had not frozen, he, he likely would have lost his life. Now, Stone he goes on to say, you know, uh, uh, he didn't, he, my six-year-old son didn't ignore me, didn't argue, or blatantly disobeyed. I said, freeze, and he froze, and his obedience probably saved his life. Children, obey your parents. Listen to mom and dad. From their experience, they will be able to save you from a lot of pitfalls that will rob you of joy and the dangers that may even rob you of years. Children who honor and obey their Christian parents are less likely to drink and drive, less likely to do illicit drugs, less likely to engage in risky sexual practices or commit crimes. Honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on this earth because once the baby is born out of wedlock, once the car has been wrecked, once the jail cell door has slammed shut behind you or the lid of the casket has been closed, it's too late then to wish, I, I wish I had obeyed my parents. Obey your parents, honor your father and mother. And by the way, this is not optional, nor is it conditioned on having cool parents who really get it. Your, your parents may not be perfect, but that doesn't give you an excuse for blowing them off. Think of it this way. If anyone in all the world had a good reason not to obey his parents, it was Jesus, right? I mean, he was perfect. His parents weren't perfect, but he was perfect. And yet, what does it say about Jesus in Luke chapter 2, verse 51? That he went down to Nazareth with Mary and Joseph and was obedient to them. Even Jesus knew he had to obey his parents. Sometimes your parents may not seem too swift, but it's in your best interest to obey them anyway, and it's not always easy. So what does it look like, you know, for a Christian kid to be obedient to mom and dad? Let me give you uh, some ideas here of how this might work. When I was in high school, I remember a pastor saying to us that you need to think of your parents' commandments as an opportunity to cooperate with God. That's a pretty profound thing when you think about it. Think of your parents' commandments as an opportunity to cooperate with God. God is the one who gave these people to you, after all. He put them in your life. And, and he, as your Lord, says, I want you to obey them. So every time they give you something to do, it's an opportunity for you to cooperate with God. When my parents tell me to do something, the Lord says, I want you to obey them. Now that means that I do what they say without whining or complaining or raising my voice to them. John Maxwell tells a story about two boys who are walking to school together talking about their families and one boy said to the other, I've uh, figured out a new system for getting along with my mother. It works great. And the other kid said, oh yeah, what is it? He says, she tells me what to do and I do it. <laughs> what a concept, right? Children, obey your parents in the Lord. I, I, I th and, and, and think about this. If your parents are being unreasonable about something, you have a unique opportunity that other people don't have. If your parents are being unreasonable, you can pray about it and ask God to change their minds. It's not your job to change their minds. Their job is to give you direction for life. But if you think they're steering you wrong or they're, they're being overly harsh or they're being overly restrictive, you can ask God to change their minds. Now, if you can't ask God to change their minds, then it's probably something you shouldn't be doing anyway, right? But in Proverbs 23, 1, it says, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and like rivers of water, he turns it wherever he will. If God can change the heart of a king, he can change the heart of a mom or dad that needs changing. Here's another tip. Seek your parents' forgiveness when you've disobeyed. Don't wait for them to find out from someone else what you've done. Because if, if they find out, you know, from somebody else or by some other means that, you know, you disobeyed them, uh, that only fosters distrust, right? They're going to say, I can't, I can't trust him. But if you messed up and you go to your mom and dad and say, Mom, Dad, I messed up. I'm, here's what I did. I'm so sorry. Guess what's going to happen? their trust in you is going to grow. 
I remember when my daughter Jill uh, was in high school and she went off on a Saturday evening to a movie with friends. Now, before they went off you know, to, to a movie or something, we always asked, well, what are you going to see? Because we wanted to kind of give them some guidance about whether that was something they should be putting in their heads or not. And she told me some PG movie or something. We said, fine, you know, go ahead. She came back later that night and I said, hey, how was the movie? And she immediately kind of broke down in tears and she said, dad, you should ground me right now. I, we didn't go to that movie. I said, you didn't go to that movie? I said, it, what happened? She said, well, you know, my friends said, ah, that's a stupid movie, I don't want to see it. So they wanted to see this other movie and it was rated R and I went and I put stuff in my head I never should have put in there and, and you should ground me right now. I said, okay, uh, how long should I ground you for? She said, I don't like two weeks. I said, okay, you're grounded for two weeks. <laughs> Truth of the matter was, I didn't, I didn't keep her grounded for two weeks because you know what? I learned something really important about her that night that she was starting to be able to make good moral judgments for herself. And she wasn't going to make that mistake again. I, had lear I learned that night that I could trust her in the future in a way that I hadn't been able to before. Here's something else you can do. You know, when your parents tell you to do something, don't just do what they tell you to do. Go above and beyond the call of duty. I found out as a teenager that, well, I, I finally figured out that I actually liked having a clean room. And so on Saturday morning, before mom would ever start into me nagging, you know, go clean your room, go clean your room, I would clean my room. And guess what that did for my relationship with my mom? Took a lot of the tension out, you know. She learned that I was kind of growing up and taking responsibility. She kind of liked that. Uh, I'd see that the lawn needed mowing, I'd go mow it before dad would say, hey, go mow the lawn, it's getting long. Uh, I'd, I'd wash the car on Saturday afternoon, vacuum it out. And then when I went to say, hey, dad, can I have the car tonight? My dad was like, yeah, sure, you washed it. You, you go ahead and take it. Just bring, some, bring it back with some gas left in the tank. You know, that was his one thing he always tell me. When you start going above and beyond the call of duty and taking initiative like that, you're going to find out your parents like it. It's going to show your parents that you're learning to take responsibility for yourself, and it's going to teach them that they, they can treat you more like an adult uh, and give you more privileges the way you'd like. And kids, don't forget to thank them from time to time for what they do for you. A little word of appreciation here or there would go a long way. It's a pretty thankless job being a parent sometimes. You know, you, you work hard uh, to pay the mortgage, to put food on the table, kids, pay, uh, you know, uh, clothes on the kid's back. And uh, if all you ever get back is whining and complaining and I don't want to do that, it, it, it makes a parent say, well, pfft, what am I doing all this for, right? But if a kid would for, every so often just say, hey, mom, dad, Thanks for all you do for us. I really appreciate it. After, after you call 911 to pick them up off the floor and, and you know, <laughs> check out their heart, you're going to find out that, that they really appreciate that kind of response from a kid. I, my, my son Josh was a master at this. You know, he, when he was a teenager, from the time he was probably in middle school, whenever we were finished eating dinner, he would start clearing the table picking up the plates, bringing them to the counter, and inevitably along the way he'd say, hey mom, thanks for making that great meal. Now, don't you think that that kind of word of appreciation goes a long way with parents? I'm telling you that those who are in Christ should do family life better than anyone else. Children who are in Christ are more highly motivated to obey their parents. They understand the importance of it, and they understand it's what God wants from them. Here's the parents' part in all of this. Parents who are in Christ are more purposeful in how they raise their children. Parents who are in Christ are more purposeful about how they raise their children. Now, you ask a lot of people what their goals are for parenting, and they'll scratch their head and say, oh, you're supposed to have goals for parenting? You know, hadn't thought about that. Or most often what you get from people is, oh, I, I just want to raise my kids so they'll be happy. Guess what? As a Christian parent, your job isn't to raise your kids so that they'll be happy. Your job as a Christian parent is to raise your kids so that they'll understand how to walk with God for themselves. And if you do that, they'll be happy. You don't have to worry about their happiness if you teach them to walk with God. Some people will say, you know, I want to raise my kids so they have great self-esteem. Well, guess what? We've got a whole generation of people who have great, great self-esteem, but they don't have a clue how to do life. But if you raise your kids to have great God-esteem then you know, they'll learn their proper place in relationship to God. They'll learn that I'm a much-loved child of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's all the self-esteem you ever need in life, isn't it? Amen. 
So let's make sure that we have the right purpose in raising our kids. And that's where verse four comes in, where it says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. See, parents who are in Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ are careful to parent in a way that's not just in their own best interest, but is truly in the best interest of their children. That means there are certain things they don't do, and there are other things that they make sure they do. Now, let's talk about the negative first, the things that the parent shouldn't do in raising kids. Paul starts with a negative to avoid when he says, fathers do not provoke your children to anger. Sometimes translated, fathers don't exasperate your children, or as Paul puts it in Colossians 3.21, fathers do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. It's so easy for parents, for dads in particular, to exasperate their children, to provoke their children to anger. I can't tell you down through the years how many people I've counseled who are working through some really, really difficult stuff as adults, some of them carrying deep wounds and, 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 and hardcore anger and what it really stems back to is, is parents, especially fathers, who embittered them by the way they treated them, by the way they talked to them. One of the ways fathers frequently exasperate their children is through their words, right? Uh, family specialist Delmer Holbrook and his wife lectured and conducted surveys across the United States. They surveyed hundreds of children, and the Holbrooks came up with the three things fathers most frequently say to their kids. Guess what number one was? I'm too tired. Number two, we don't have enough money. And three was just keep quiet. Now what if those are the three things your kids are most often hearing from your lips? I'm too tired, we don't have enough money, just keep quiet. Think of how that can ex exasperate, frustrate a kid. What they need to hear is I love you. I care about you, I, I, want, I want you to walk with Jesus. When, when people don't hear expressions of parental love, it, it can be devastating for a lifetime. There's a study that was done of uh, Christian college students on a college campus where they looked at factors contributed to teenage rebellion. The number one factor that contributed to teenage rebellion among Christian college students was that the parents had an unhappy marriage. So kids looked at mom and dad, and mom and dad have this terrible marriage, and the kids say, I don't want to be like that. I'm not going to follow their way. I'm not going to embrace their faith. I'm going to go do my own thing. Leading to the observation that the very best thing that a dad can do for his kids is to really love their mother. Factor number two that most often contributed to teenage rebellion among Christian college students, discipline was either overly restrictive or overly permissive. Either parents just came crashing down on them too hard or they didn't give them any boundaries at all, kind of left them to fend for themselves. Here's somebody has put together a list of how to provoke a child to anger. It goes like this, say one thing and do another. Always blame, never praise. Be inconsistent and unfair in discipline. Show favoritism. Compare the child to others. Make promises and don't keep them. Make light of the child's problems. Don't give them boundaries and then come down hard on them and, and finally make constant unreasonable demands of them that they can never meet. As one dad put it several years ago, my son Steve tried out for the football team. He burst into my office with great enthusiasm to say, dad, I made the team. I turned and said to him immediately, yeah, but are you starting? He said, I watched my son turn and walk out of my office crushed. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Here's the positive part of purposeful Christian parenting. Bring them up, it says. Nourish them. This is the word that was used back in chapter 5 to talk about the way Jesus cares for the church. He nourishes her. He cares for her. He loves her toward a better future. The parent's work is to nurture and care for children so that they are brought to maturity. 
for a Christian parent, there's a particular agenda, a particular curriculum for how they're brought to maturity. It's to, to bring them up in the training, the dis- discipline and instruction of the Lord. A parent's job is to show children how to live. That word instruction, uh, a discipline means training. Uh, the word instruction means admonition or correction by word of mouth. So a parent's job is by actions and by words to show a child how to live a life that pleases God. It's also the kind of training and instruction the Lord himself would approve. Now, if you're going to do this, it means, first of all, that you've got to be growing in the Lord yourself, right? Spending time in God's word, Growing in the faith, spending time in prayer, especially in prayer for your kids, in fellowship with other believers who will encourage you and hold you accountable and help you to grow because you can't give away what you don't have. I once uh, preached this very sermon at a church in Minnesota, and it was a a church of predominantly senior citizens. The, The single largest age group in that church by decade was people in their 80s. But we were preaching through Ephesians and it came to this passage and I'm like, great. And I'm preaching on Ephesians 6, 1 through 4 to people who are pretty much done raising their kids. And uh, I, I preached the message and after the message, a guy named Wally Anderson came up to me afterward. Wally was in his 80s. He was a medical doctor by profession, had retired, a family practitioner. He and his wife had raised eight kids, <laughs> uh, all of whom came to know Christ as their savior and were walking in the faith. I had an opportunity to do Wally's funeral a year or so later and it was amazing to hear these kids talk about their mom and dad and and, and essentially how how they did everything that we're talking about here in the sermon today and what an impact it had on their lives. But here comes Wally after this sermon on, you you know, raise your children in the training and instruction of the Lord and he said, Dave, you've helped me, helped me figure out my purpose today. And I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, I I figured out that my purpose is to keep spiritually ahead of my kids. Here was a guy who rightly figured out that you never stop being a parent. That even as an 80-something-year-old father, his job wasn't done where his kids were concerned. That if he could keep spiritually ahead of his kids, then he could continue to show them the way in life. As they grew older, they would see by his example what it means to to live as a believer in Christ as you approach the end of life. So you've got to be growing in the Lord for yourself. But if you're going to raise your kids in the training and instruction of the Lord, it also means that you need a purposeful way of transferring your faith to your kids beginning with the gospel, right? The people in all the world who most need to hear the gospel from you are your own children. And it's not rocket science. You don't have to get all complicated about it. It could be as simple as what my mom shared with me when I was like four years old and, and sitting on her lap. And I had asked her, you know, why did Jesus die on the cross? And she said, oh, you know, Davey, come here. Let me explain this to you. And she talked about how my heart was dirty with sin and how Jesus had had died on the sin, uh, died on the cross to pay the penalty of our sin. And he, he rose again, and now he'd like to come into your heart and wash it clean and come and live there forever. Would you like that? <laughs> and I put my faith in Christ as my Savior that day and have never looked back. You need to begin the curriculum by sharing the good news of the gospel with your kids But then, if you're going to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord, you need some way of getting them into this book, right? Or more importantly, you need a way of getting this book into them. Because it's only here that kids will learn what it means to live a life pleasing to the Lord. When you learn the scriptures, you learn what it is that pleases God. You learn to think the way God thinks. You learn to love the things God loves. You begin to desire for yourself the very things that God most wants for you. So how are you going to get your kids into this book? Again, it's not rocket science. I mean, when our kids were very small, we began uh, by making sure we always had age-appropriate Bible story books, however old they were. Because we'd always read to our kids before they went to bed at night, 
you know, some of their favorite stories and whatnot, but we'd always finish by reading from the Bible, reading Bible stories to them. So they began to learn the truths of the faith from the time they were very small. Now, when our kids got older and they were kind of getting past, you know, mom and dad reading Bible stories to them at bedtime, we had a, a time of family devotions at the dinner table in the evening. My dad always did this with us when I was a kid. You know, my dad was a blue collar guy, truck driver, never went to seminary, but I'll tell you what, he had a good curriculum. He made sure that he got this into us, and it was very simple. Uh, at the end of dinner every evening, he would take the Bible and the daily bread off the top of the refrigerator in our kitchen. That's where it was kept. And he would look up in the daily bread, you know, it was a scripture reading for the day, and we'd read that passage of scripture, and then he'd read from the daily bread devotional so that we'd have, you know, some way of thinking about what that text said. And then we'd pray together. My dad made sure that we were, as a family, in the word. He imparted a curriculum to us in that very simple way. When our kids got older, we uh, got a subscription to the Navigator's Family Walk devotional. Uh, a really good, again, appropriate for kids or parents with families, with kids. And uh, it's a great way of getting your kids into the scripture and, and reading a short devotional with them. As our kids got older and they kind of outgrew that, we got uh, a DC Talks Jesus Freaks book. A great book full of stories about Christians down through the ages who lived radically for Christ. And that was a great way of, of challenging our kids to, to walk radically with Christ in their public school. So you gotta be growing yourself, you gotta have a way of transferring your faith to the kids, a, a curriculum that you're, you're using to get them into the word. And, and then it means to be alert to opportunities along the way to talk about faith and, and how it applies to everyday life because all of life becomes a laboratory for, for helping them understand how, how God works and how his ways are best. You know, Moses told this to the people of Israel way back in Deuteronomy 6. He said, these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in the house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. All of life, a laboratory for teaching them about God and his ways. And so I remember, for instance, at dinner time when our kids were in high school, going to public high school, and they'd come home every night with questions, you know, my teachers say this, my friends say that, and dinner time basically became a, a, an apologetic seminar. Every, every night we talk about, all right, what do, you, what do you think about that? How do you respond to that? Where, where does the scripture talk about that? On one occasion, we were driving to the airport. Uh, my daughters and I, we were going to pick up grandma, I think, from the Philadelphia airport, and somewhere uh, about 10 minutes into the trip, one of the girls raised a theological question. I think they were in probably junior high, early high school at the time. And this, it started a marvelous conversation about the scriptures and about God and, and, and about theology that lasted all the way down to the Philadelphia airport. It was one of the most richest conversations I've ever had that has to do with, you know, the scriptures and how they apply to life. Just be alert you know, when they have a teachable moment and they're inquisitive and they're wanting to know, don't be afraid to speak into their lives and, and to invite them to ask those questions and, and to have conversations about, about how these things work and how, how God would have us view them. Nobody should do family life better than people who have new life in Jesus. When children are in Christ and are highly motivated to obey and honor mom and dad and, and parents who are in Christ are purposeful in their parenting so that instead of exasperating their children, they are careful to nourish them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And when that's all going on in a family, it is a beautiful thing to behold. Let me tell you about a family in the San Francisco Bay Area that had that kind of commitment. The Kraft family, they had a son named David. David uh, came to trust Christ as a boy, grew up loving Jesus, so much so that he wanted to go into the ministry and, and went to seminary, and after seminary, he went to work for Fellowship of Christian Athletes. He was a big athletic guy, uh, six foot two, 200 pounds, and um, at the age of 32, he was diagnosed with, with cancer. And the cancer began to rack his body. And, and he went from being 200 pounds to being 80 pounds. 
And as it came clear that he was about to step from this life into eternity, he asked his dad to come to his hospital room. And when his dad got there, he said, Dad, do you remember when I was a little boy and you used to hold me in your arms close to your chest and hold me really tight? Could you do that again? One last time. And Mr. Kraft picked up the, the body of his six foot two inch, 80 pound son, cradled him in his arms and held him close to his chest. And there they were, father and son, eyeball to eyeball, looking at each other, not able to say a word and tears streaming down both of their faces. When David said to his dad, thank you for building into my life the kind of character that can enable me to face even this moment. Children, obey your parents. Honor your father and mother. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but nourish them, raise them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Let me have you stand. And I'll pray for us as we leave. Lord, we stand before you today, people who are in awe of your word and the clarity of your instruction for us, the beauty of it, your design for family life. And Lord, I pray that by your spirit and with your help, your empowerment, as we walk with your son, that you would help us to more nearly live out these ideals that we may experience for ourselves more of the kind of beautiful family life that, that you lay out for us in scripture. But Lord, there are plenty of us who are walking wounded when it comes to family life too. For many of us, family life hasn't lived up to that beautiful ideal. And so many of us are carrying deep wounds. Some of us are carrying bitterness and anger. Some of us are living with broken relationships. Lord, in all of that, we, we wanna give you thanks and praise that whatever the state of our families, we know that in Christ, we have a loving heavenly father who will never leave us nor forsake us. One who works in all things for good for those who love him who are called according to his purpose. And we know, we, we affirm with confidence that you are a God who's able to take the broken, even shattered pieces of our family life and yet redeem them and make of them something truly beautiful and good. And so Lord, we just reach out to you and say, Oh, Father, have your way. Have your way in our hearts. Have your way in our lives. Have your way in our families because we want what you want for, for us. And Lord, I pray that, that as you take great families and, and make them even better, as you take broken families and heal them, that, that we, as the people of Bayside Chapel, would be a testimony to this community of the, the amazing things that you can do to transform lives and transform families and may others come to know him because they want to know what makes our family tick. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And go forth to live for his glory. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, everybody.